I'd like to speak this morning on evolutionary gratitude for challenging times. I love the fact the theme this month is gratitude. And Reverend Lisa and I discussed this title long before the election. And this notion that we are the result of 14 billion years of grace. That's not the only way to interpret it, but it's by far the most empowering way to interpret it, this 14 billion year story. In fact, that's what my stole is here. This is the 14 billion year, 13.82 to be exact, but we'll round it off to 14 billion year history of everyone and everything. Each bead signifies some significant event in the history of everyone and everything. This is our common creation story. This is the first and only globally produced, evidence-based creation story. My first beat is all of our different, these little, kind of like diamonds, look like diamonds, right? All of our different names for reality. Whether you use divine language or secular language, reality is more. We need to live in the right relationship to reality or we go extinct just like any other species. So when I use the word God, and I know I don't probably have to say this here in this context, but others will be watching this sermon on, on YouTube, and so they're not necessarily from the New Thought tradition. So I just want to define what I mean and what I don't mean by the word God. When I use the word God, in fact, I've even started spelling it G-O-D-D-E. <laughs> Sounds the same, God, G-O-D-D-E. But it sort of snaps people out of this knee-jerk thought that when I'm talking about some, some male supernatural being who resides off the planet and outside the universe who blesses some and smites others. <laughs> so that's not what I'm talking about. God, as most of us from this evolutionary, sacred evolutionary and sacred ecology perspective use the word God, it's reality with a personality, not a person outside reality. God, reality with a personality, not a person outside of it. In other words, everything that is fundamentally, undeniably, and inescapably real, personified, deified, that's what God is. Nothing less than that. So that includes the universe. God is the universe plus, not some being outside the universe. God is time plus. God is transcendent mystery plus. God is consciousness plus. All of that must be included in any concept of the word God, any understanding of the word God. Otherwise, it's not God we're talking about. So it doesn't matter whether you believe in the universe or not, right? And if you do believe in the universe, whatever that could possibly mean, it's not going to get you to some special place when you die. And if you don't believe in the universe, it's not going to put you in some really scary place either. Right? So what we're talking about, again, is reality with personality. So I want to offer three principles that we get from the history of everyone and everything, from the, what's called the big history, or the epic of evolution, or the universe story. Connie and I have been calling it the great story. Because when we ground our religiosity, our spirituality, our lives, our practices in the history of everyone and everything, there's some understandings that we get that are pretty profound in terms of helping us face whatever challenges we have in the present moment from a place of gratitude and from a place of what my mentor Joanna Macy calls active hope. Active hope. Not passive sit around, wait for the second coming of Christ like some supernatural being hope, but active hope. Where we be the second coming of Christ. That is, we be Christians, saviors of the future, redeemers of humanity. points around evolutionary gratitude in challenging times. First one has to do with facts. Second one has to do with values. The third one has to do with legacy. Facts, values, and legacy. So the first thing to say, the first principle, one of the first principles, and obviously there are many, many, many things I could say, principles about we get from evolution, we get from the history of everyone and everything that can inspire us in the present moment. So these three are not like the, you know, the final list. But I think these three will do this week. The first
first is that decline is divine and chaos catalyzes creativity. One of the fundamental lessons that we learned from 13.8 billion years of unbroken evolution is A, we are not separate from the universe. The universe began in simple hydrogen and has been expanding and becoming more complex and becoming more self-aware. And in this solar system, the universe became complex enough and self-aware enough that the universe began to contemplate itself. We are literally, human beings are literally the universe becoming aware of itself. We didn't come into the world, we grew out of it. In the same way that apples grow out of an apple tree. We grow out of the planet. We grow out of the dynamics of the universe. We are organically related to nature. We are nature evolved to the place that it could begin to contemplate its own nature. Literally, this is a fact. There's no scientist in the world who disagree with this. We are the result of 14 billion years of unbroken grace now becoming aware of itself and now learning that it needs to live in alignment with the principles of God's nature, not the environment. Notice, if I call primary reality, that is the air, water, soil, and life upon which we all depend, that which brought us into being, that which nourishes and sustains us, and that which receives us at our end, if we call that the environment, we get this delusion that we can just do whatever we want with it. Because our true home is somewhere else and we die, right? So we start treating nature as an it to be exploited rather than a vow to be honored and respected. And as Martin Buber, the famous Jewish theologian, said decades ago, we will cause our own extinction if we treat primary reality, nature, the universe, the planet, as an it that we think we can use and exploit. So the first principle is that decline is divine, because when you understand the history of the universe, you realize that evolution isn't an arrow of a trajectory. The, in fact, I would say that the, the most important lesson in the history of everyone and everything, is that the primary thing that drives and catalyzes creativity and transformation is chaos, breakdowns, and bad news. Nothing is more important. Seriously, nothing is more important. How did this become this become this? Because see, I have this in order. I've got the early universe, I go through all the way, I've got the dinosaurs and all the evolution of life, and then the scientific discoveries that have helped us come to understand our sacred story, right? How did most of these transformations happen? It was because of chaos forced it down. Breakdowns forced it down. Even in human history, so many of us who were in the progressive movement or the, who fancy ourselves as liberals, we have this erroneous view of evolution. Like it's all about just things getting better and better and easier and easier, wealthier and wealthier. No, that's not what evolution is. What evolution is about is adapting to what's real. Being with what's real, making the best of it, and then being a blessing to the future and to the body of life. In fact, that's one of the great, well, that's my second point. I want to get ahead of myself. <laughs> so this notion that decline is divine and that chaos catalyzes creativity. Here's one of the things we know about human evolution. We don't believe this. This is knowledge. This is not beliefs. Okay? We need to give God glory for the knowledge. There have been 24 previous complex civilizations that have become great, and then their own greatness becomes their own undoing. And there's a dark age. And then another civilization becomes great in very different ways and creates very different wonderful things, but then it falls in the same ways. Almost always hubris, immoderate greatness. We become great, but we're not moderate. We're not, we're, 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 we're arrogant. In fact, I love, one of my favorite authors on the planet is John Michael Greer. We've read 12 of his books in the last three years. I actually sell four of them. And I love his definition of hubris. He actually gets this from the Greeks, but I first learned it from him. Hubris is the overweening pride of the doomed. <laughs> so it, one of the interesting things, when you understand history, when you set these 24 previous civilizations side by side by side and step back and learn what are the patterns, because that's what evolution partly is about, is pattern. What are the patterns 
that in the rise of civilizations and in the growing old and dying of civilizations. Imagine that you had only a sample size of one. You had one human being who's 70, 70 years old, or 75 years old, and he's, he or she is starting to deteriorate and slow down and losing some faculties, but you only had a sample size of one, and your beliefs were that you were eternally going to continue living. You'd be really flummoxed. You'd be, what's wrong? But if you have 24 human beings and you realize that they all grow old and then they all die, and they create different great things in their life and legacy, but they all die from some of the same reasons, then you understand that something's at work here that we can call God or Satan. In fact, we can blame it too. We can say, this shouldn't be. You know, some of the techno-optimists refuse to accept decline, refuse to accept chaos and breakdown. There, this, this, I call it the techno-fetish religion of growth. This idea that we can have unending growth and expansion and limitlessness on a finite planet. It's insane. That's one of the reasons why we're in the mess we are now. So decline is divine and chaos catalyzes creativity. That gives me hope. It allows me to face the challenges. When you understand that, when you understand this rise and fall of civilizations, and now we have the first global civilization, yet we're falling in some of the exact same ways through overpopulating, through using more resources that nature can provide, and giving more waste, more toxic effluence that nature can absorb, and our political and economic establishments that have become insane. <laughs> Literally. I mean, I, I, I mean, I'm not being hyperbole. In fact, to use, since I'm in a religious setting, I know this is not language that we use in this tradition, in the New Thought tradition, but I'm going to use it anyway. <laughs> we have a demonic economic system. We have an economic system. See, here's the thing. Good and evil are always about how we impact the community and how that ripples out to the future. So if I do something that's good and kind and generous, I've done a good thing. If I do something that's harmful or, or hurtful to others in the future, I've done a bad thing. If I sacrifice to be a blessing to others in the future, I've done a great thing or a heroic thing. But if I self-centeredly serve my own needs, screw others. To hell with the future. I've done an evil thing. This is not moral rocket science. <laughs> and so any system that makes it easier or inevitable for billions of good people to, eat, to do evil, if the word demonic has any meaning in a modern world, it's got to be that. And here, let, let me characterize it. You tell me whether you think this is an, an accurate characterization of our current global economic system. It measures progress by how fast we can take the biosphere and turn it into pollution. Okay? How fast we can do that, that's progress. As if we can have human progress at a diminishing point. It rewards the few at the expense of the many. And it forces billions of us to betray the future just by pursuing the good life. In all of human history, the only sustainable societies have been those that mimicked ecology in their economics. Any economic system that doesn't, doesn't mimic the laws of ecology is unsustainable. And let's be clear, unsustainable is just a pretty word for evil. So decline is divine and chaos catalyzes creativity. And when I understand that, I can be present to the challenges of the present moment, the things that don't go the way I wish they would, from a place of not, oh no, this shouldn't be, to, oh, of course, I've been expecting it. Come on in. <laughs> the second point has to do with value. And this is, of course, at the heart of unity and new thought in general. This understanding that interpretations matter. In fact, mythic interpretations may matter the most. That is how we interpret reality. What determines the, 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 the quality of any person's life isn't first and foremost what happens to them. It's how they interpret what happens to them. In fact, if there were one skill I wish I could impart to young people most, it would be the skill, like, like exercising a muscle, the skill of learning to interpret life mythically, generously. And so when we understand that, we realize that, to, and what I mean, let me explain this, 
What I mean by interpreting mythically is to freely personify, use this understanding that our brains are personifying machines. What our brains do innately is give human characteristics to what's more than human, what's other than human. Poseidon was not the god of the oceans. Poseidon was not the spirit of the oceans. Poseidon was a personification of the incomprehensibly powerful and capricious seas. It doesn't matter whether you believe in the oceans or not. They're inescapable. Gaia was not the goddess of the earth. Gaia was not the spirit of the earth. Gaia was a personification, a deification of this one planet in which we live and move and have our being. All gods and goddesses are at the very least deifications or personifications of some aspect of reality. That's why when I say God is reality with a personality, not a person outside reality, I'm saying that if we don't have an I-thou relationship to what's fundamentally, undeniably, and inescapably real, we are missing out on a huge source of inspiration to be present to the challenges and then to be a blessing. Because that's what unity and new thought and it's all about. It's, you know, some people have mistaken. They think that, you know, if I just have the right beliefs, the universe is a slot machine. And I'm going to get what I want if I just have the right mantras, the right affirmations, the right beliefs. Right? No, that's not it. What New Thought is about, what the Fillmores were about, what, what, what all the New Thought thinkers were about, was that no matter what's real, you can stay present to it, you can filter it through your heart, get to gratitude, and then be a blessing to your community and a blessing to the future, whatever is real. It's the fundamental evolutionarily adaptive mindset. So Connie and I, for example, we personify everything. We love living a mythic life. <laughs> Our name for North America is Nora. We say we're falling ever more in love with Nora. And because we personify, that is a mythic personification of this continent, we actually have the felt experience. Having traveled for 15 years all over North America, we are falling ever more in love with Nora. And that's our experience. In fact, I'll be showing this afternoon probably about 100 photos of Nora. We call it Nora porn. <laughs> Trust me, it's hot. It's hot. <laughs> Our relationship is Jasmine. There's Connie, there's Michael, and then there's Jasmine. And Jasmine is the mythic personification of us or we. And sometimes it's really clear what Michael wants to do, and it's really clear what Connie wants to do. But when one of us asks, what does Jasmine want? It allows me as a man to not be attached to my position. And I can go with something she might have suggested in the first place, but I don't feel like she's won and I've lost. I feel proud that I'm doing what's good for Jasmine. Sure. Now, why it is that Jasmine usually wants to do what she wanted to do in the first place, I haven't figured that out. But, you know, a happy wife is a happy life, as they say. In the morning and in the evening, what, what you call the sun, we call great soul. Capital S O L. And we sing in the morning. The first time we see Great Soul, we sing, Hi, hi, Great Soul. And we've got this whole song we do. And then in the evening, Bye, bye, Great Soul. It's having an I thou relationship to primary reality. And of course, God includes all these the oceans, Gaia, Great Soul, everything. So, number one, realize that decline is divine, and that chaos catalyzes creativity, and we have unbelievable amounts, mountains of evidence that that's the case. Number two, interpret life mythically. Get in the habit of personifying. Just see what happens in your life, I promise. It'll be transformative if you actually do this, if you haven't done this naturally or wrong. The third principle we get from evolution that we get from the history of everyone and everything, that we get from big history or the epic of evolution or the universe story, the third thing is the realization that we can never ever predict how our impact will ripple out. We can never know what our positive impact will be. And the amazing thing is, it's not just your good works. Haven't there been people in your life 
who have made a profound difference in your life because of their lousy example? <laughs> they were a real jerk, right? And you made some positive choice in your life as a result, right? Now, do you honestly think that you haven't been blessing others in the same way? <laughs> In chaos theory, they call it the butterfly effect. A butterfly's wings in Hong Kong and it can affect the weather in New York. Right? This is a scientific fact. We can never know how the ripples are. I mean, here's the thing. Let me just, a little exercise. Let's just pretend now you will actually impact dozens, probably hundreds of people in major important ways. Sometimes from your good example, sometimes from your bad example. But let's just pretend, just to make it easy to think about, that you only significantly impact three people, like in a life-changing way. And then each of those three people go on to impact just three people. But one of them goes on to impact 30 million people who would not have been impacted in a positive way if you hadn't made your little difference over here. So we can never know. So here's the thing. If you can't know what your positive impact will be, just get on with it! <laughs> Just follow the place where your joy and the world's needs intersect. Where your joy and the future's needs intersect. In fact, there's an exercise that I used to always invite people to do, which is take a piece of paper, not now, but you just, you know, I invite you to do this in the next 24 hours or so. Take a piece of paper, draw a line down the middle so you've got two columns. On the left-hand side of this, all the things that light you up, that give you joy, that give you energy, that give you a sense of energy, Fulfillment and happiness, things that you're good at, things other people tell you that you're good at, etc. List all. Top of that list, you put my great joy. On the other side, list all the things that you're aware of in the world, where you feel the world's needs. Who are the people threatened by this latest election? Who are the people for whom your heart hurts with compassion? Where you feel anger, where you feel fear. You know, get in touch with not what you intellectually know about what's needed, but where do you feel it? Where do you feel it? And then write all that stuff down. The world's great needs, or the future's great needs, as I feel them. And this is all that. And then just pay attention to your heart. There's a reason that all spiritual and religious uh, uh, traditions talk about the heart. Asking Jesus into our heart, the heart. There's all this wisdom because... There's a lot of neuronal, there's a lot of brain cells that are around our heart. And so when we pay attention to this part of our body, whether you call it prayer or meditation, it doesn't matter. You're trying to play, you've got your list, and you're basically asking God, reality, life, the universe, to help you see the intersections. Where, you're basically trying to play mix and match. Where are the intersections between what lights you up, what gives you joy, what gives you energy, and what the world's needs are, or your community's needs as you feel them. And that's your calling, that's your mission, that's your vocation at this time. I encourage you to do this again every five years. But it's a, it's a great way to be in that place where you can be a blessing in a way that blesses you. Where you can make a difference in a way that lights you up. Because here's the thing. If you're not lit up about what you're trying to do to benefit society or the future, ain't nobody going to join you. So now let me just say, in conclusion, because what I talk about is three principles from evolution that, can give, that bring me to gratitude. One is the realization that decline is divine and chaos catalyzes creativity. The second is that mythic interpretations matter most. And the third is that since I don't know my impact, I just gotta get on with it. And here's the thing, the universe, God, reality, whatever you wanna call this one reality in which we live and move and have our being, right? And I'm not discounting the transcendent, but I'm saying it includes time and nature. Whatever this reality is doing, it needs your flaws. It needs your stupidity. It needs your mistakes. It needs those places where you want to evolve, but it doesn't matter. Reality can use it. So stop trying to get perfect before you can make a difference. How many people do I know that are trying to, Christians, that are trying to turn it all over to Jesus and until they're living like this perfect, integrous, wonderful, pure life, they don't feel like they can really do ministry. And you got people in the Eastern tradition that are trying to, trying to witness their painful experiences and their thoughts. They're, they're trying to witness them to death. 
The universe needs your faults. So get on with the work anyway. I had a dear friend who's a spiritual teacher that most of you will probably know. I'm not going to mention him by name. He called me the morning after the election because he just needed some coaching. A dear, dear friendship. Now, to be clear, there's no way that I could in good conscience vote for Donald Trump. And I didn't. But nonetheless, when I got the results, I had this strange relief, this strange hope, and this unstrange, utter focus, <laughs> this laser focus. And I think that the strange hope and the strange relief came from this one insight, that the greatest enemy of the future, and I realize I may be overstating things here, but not much. The greatest enemy of the future is this techno-fetish religion of growth. This idea that we can have limitless expansion, limitless numbers, limitless impact on the natural world, and then, you know, from the caves to now to the stars. It's also known as globalization. There's nothing that puts more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere than what we call globalization. So this is enemy number one of the future, of future generations. And yet that delusion needs to hit the brick wall of reality. It's not going to transform in an easy, effortless way. Only after it hits the brick wall of reality do we have any hope of transformation. That's what half the books that we sell are all about. And I personally believe that we are more likely to hit that brick wall of reality under a Trump presidency than under a Clinton. And here's the thing, we need to remember this. The liberal media did not portray things accurately. Democrats and Republicans alike have conspired against the working class for 30 or 40 years. And it's, the bill is now coming due. So if chaos catalyzes creativity, I'm strangely helpful. <laughs> I'll get into a lot more of this at one o'clock.